today we're going to talk about movies. No, I'm just joking. Um, so this is a sort of play on words here. Um, as I was uh, thinking about uh, what I was going to talk on, that phrase, the Fast and the Furious movie thing came to mind, and I was like, okay, I got I to gotta play on that, <clears throat> just so it's memorable and we keep it uh, in our minds of what we're talking about. So this is actually called the Fast and the Fearless, okay, because you guys are the fearless. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with a question. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna make. I'm gonna work on making Dave fast. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop. Start by odd, asking an odd question. Are there any coffee lovers in the building? Any coffee lovers? Okay. Now my next question is, why in the world would you enjoy coffee? Because it's bitter. Yeah, sure <laughs> Now, I'm, sp I'm glad Wesley had to step out because he, I was going to have to exclude him from the poll because I said, how many like coffee, not cream and sugar with, sugar with a little coffee flavor? <clears throat> so, but, but seriously, why is coffee such a hit in our culture? I mean, even if, if it, you know, a lot of people use cream and sugar and stuff like that, but, but still, we have a ton of people that just like straight black coffee. If you like straight black coffee, raise your hand. Okay, got it. Got a few. Coffee with a little cream. Okay, there we go. Um, so, what's my point in all this? Coffee is bitter, but it's popular. It sells. People enjoy it. People drink it daily, not just for the caffeine, but for the taste as well. Okay, um, I'm not a coffee for caffeine type person. I'm a coffee for taste person. When I had to give up coffee many years ago, it was like a I don't know what a divorce feels like, but it probably felt like that. Um, it was bad. Um, next question. Similar but unrelated, and we'll tie them together here in a minute. Who enjoys going to funerals? I mean, like, don't you do that in your spare time? You search the paper and look for funerals to go, go hang out and enjoy the funeral service? No, not at all, right? So my point is, everybody likes, in that question is, everybody likes to party, but nobody likes to mourn. Mourning is difficult. Mourning hurts. It's painful. Okay? But yet, as we saw in the coffee example, there are times when things that are bitter actually are good, and we enjoy them. We can enjoy them from the proper perspective. Um, you know... Throughout our whole marriage, we've been married, uh, Sabrina and I have been married 27 and a half years. It's been interesting because the whole time I was drinking coffee, I would try to get her to try coffee like over and over and over again. And I'd try doing different things and everything. And she's like, it smells so good, but I just can't palate it. I just cannot stomach it. It just, it can't. And now I can't have coffee and she's on a coffee kick. <laughs> so that hurts. <clears throat> but... Um, Here's the tie-in to what we're talking about. The last several weeks, Rabbi uh, Damien has been talking about the biblical festivals. Okay? So let's put that first slide up. And uh, the biblical festivals that we've been talking about are Pesach, or Passover. It's also Hag Hamotzi, or Hag Hamotzot, which is the week of unleavened bread, which is technically the, the festival. We have Shavuot, which is Pentecost. We have Rosh Hashanah which is also biblically known as Yom Teruah. We also have Yom Kippur, actually biblically known as Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonements. Um, and we have Sukkot, which is tabernacles. And we, <coughs> Rabbi's done a great job at covering those, if you guys enjoyed that series. So he's talked all about these festivals in this series. And um, I'm going to put my phone up here to keep track of the time. And by the way... Um, there's an old saying that what does it mean when a preacher looks at his watch for the fourth time? Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, absolutely nothing. So, um, <clears throat> but we've been talking about the festivals. Today, I would like to talk about something that's connected with the festivals, and that is something everybody is excited about, and that is the biblical fasts. Nobody, nobody clapped, cheered, nothing. I don't, I don't get it, okay? And specifically the one coming up this Tuesday. This Tuesday, does anybody know what it is besides Dr. David? 
Yes. The 10th of Tevet. Good. It's the fast of Tevet, which is the 10th day of the Hebrew month of Tevet. Now, we may have an objection. Hey, that's not the Bible, right? Um, but the answer to that question is actually yes and no, okay? Because the Bible doesn't specifically say observe this fast, but it does refer to it, okay? So um, turn to uh, Zechariah 8, 19, or we can pull up the slide here. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month. So we'll talk about each one of these here in just a second. The fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth month, the fast of the seventh month, the fast of the tenth, speaking, talking about months again, shall be to the house of Judah seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. Now, let's walk through each of these. What are each one of these fasts that the book of Zechariah is talking about? So we have first the fast in the fourth month, and this is at the bottom of the screen called Sum Tammuz, which means, simply means the fast of Tammuz. It's on the 17th day of the Hebrew month of Tammuz. And it uh, historically remembers the day that Moses broke the two tablets of stone on Mount Sinai. It remembers when the daily uh, Tammuz, or their continual offerings, uh, ceased to be brought during a certain circumstance. And an idol was erected in the temple. Now it also, the next slide please, it also has uh, implications that happen later on uh, after this scripture was uh, given to us. During the Roman siege of Jerusalem, the city walls were breached, leading to the destruction of the second temple on Tisha B'Av. Everybody's familiar with Tisha B'Av, which we will talk about if you're not. <coughs> um, and then prior to the Bar Kokhba revolt, which was at the, after the uh, destruction of the seventh, second temple, the merit, uh, Roman military leader Apostomus burned a Torah scroll. And then this is also is the day that the Bain Hamesarim begins. Okay, these are, it literally means between the straits, but these are the three weeks between this particular fast day and um, Tisha B'Av, which are three weeks of fasting, I mean, not fasting, three weeks of fasting. Woo, that would be difficult, right? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> Deborah's going to try it and, see, and tell us how it works. <laughs> okay, it is uh, three weeks of mourning. Um, it's, a, it's a time that we mourn the loss of the temple, and there are a lot of things that we don't do during that, that time period, such as enjoy music and, and different things, okay? And so uh, next slide, we'll move on to the next fast. The fast of the fifth month remembers, and this is the big one, remembers the destruction of not only the first temple, but the second temple as well. Both temples were destroyed on the same day of the calendar. Can you believe that? Okay, this is called Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av simply means the ninth day of the month of Av. Okay, Tisha is, is uh, Tisha, it's literally, I mean, um, more uh, correctly pronounced, is the ninth of the month of Av. Okay, and we have the next one, which is the one where, uh, actually, the seventh month, which just happened a, a couple months ago. The governor of Jerusalem was assassinated, and you can find them in these passages if you want to look this up. Um, and this is called Sum Gedalia, and it means the fast of Gedalia. So Gedalia was the governor of um, Jerusalem, and when he was assassinated, that began the spiral down of how Jerusalem fell, okay, um, to the Babylonians. And so in, in this, we remember that. And it's technically, is it the first or the second day of Tishrei? Well, uh, technically. We observe it on the third day. It's either the first or the second that, that the day actually happened on, but we don't observe it on that day because of Rosh Hashanah, okay? But it's observed on the third. <clears throat> Next one. And this is the one that's coming up Tuesday. This is the, uh, it's called the 10th of Tevet, uh, the fast of Tevet. And it, it, it remembers, it uh, helps us to remember the siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so these are all these fasts that are mentioned in the book of Zechariah. Now, 
What's interesting about this passage is, if you'll throw the next slide up, is it's also the same passage that says, that the one that we like to as Gentiles quote all the time, Thus says the Lord of hosts, People shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going, and many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. So you see the nations come in, and then here's the key verse. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take a hold of the, and this translation says the row, but it's not an accurate translation. It's the biknaf uh, is, is the Hebrew word. It's, it's literally the corners, and what's on the corner of a Jewish garment? The tzitzit, okay, the, the fringes. Take hold of the corners of the garment of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So I think a lot of us in this room are have have done that. We have holding, taken hold of the, the garment, the, the corners of the fringes of this man named this Jewish man named Yeshua and said, take me with you because I want to learn your ways. Let your God be my God. Let your people be my people. And so um, <clears throat> the the difficult part in all this is that you know we, we have a good time at Shalom Aiken, don't we? Anybody enjoy our Hanukkah party? Hanukkah weekend. I mean, that was amazing. That was simply amazing. We had so much fun. and We, we deepened relationships. We had a blast at this Hanukkah weekend, the Shabbaton that we just had. It was amazing. Now, everybody likes a party, but nobody likes a fast. Okay? And so let's talk about fasting and why fasting is important. Let's talk about what exactly is fasting. I mean, besides just being hungry all day. Fasting, you can throw the next slide up there, is the denying is denying the flesh of what it wants. And here's the key. So we can hear the voice of the soul tell us what it wants. It's denying the flesh what it wants. So we can hear the voice of the soul tell us what it wants. One of the most, um, and I'll try to say this without just going completely blubbering idiot, but one of the most meaningful um, conversations I've had with my children was from one of my sons that came back from youth camp a few years ago. And this is what he said. He said to our family, he said, I want you guys to know, and I wrote this down so I would have it specifically the way I want to say it is, until camp, I never knew how hungry my soul was. I never knew how hungry my soul is. Why is that? Because we have so many distractions in this world to push down the voice of the soul. We have so many distractions that we can cover it up, that we can listen to other things, we can watch a television show, we can play a video game, we can read a book, we can do whatever, and we don't have to listen to the voice of the soul that says, I need, I need God, I need nourishment, spiritual nourishment. We don't know how hungry our souls are. You've seen the, um, this is really popular um, appeal back when I was growing up, um, the um, feeding the homeless in Africa, right? And they would show all these, um, Save the Children, I think it was, or something like that, um, Compassion International and, and things. But they would show the children, and it was sad, and it still is, it still goes on today. But they showed the children walking around with these distended bellies, right? They were, they were starving, but it, let, it looked like they were full. That's how we are a lot of times. We feel full, we may look full, but we're starving on the inside because we push down the voice of the Spirit. <clears throat> My next question is, why should we, as followers of Yeshua, fast, not just fast? I mean, Yom Kippur is one thing, that's biblical, right? But why should we 
do these minor fasts that really aren't even commanded in the scriptures. And, you know, after all, didn't Yeshua already fulfill that scripture in Zechariah? It says he's turned the fasting, the weeping, and the mourning into joy and gladness, you know? I think if we are, we're honest, the reason why we want to put that light on things and put that spin on things and, and, and look at the passage that way is because, number one, fasting is uncomfortable. Number two, Minor fasts are not biblically mandated, and therefore we see them as optional. And we say, we, we have the voice of the perpetual teenager inside us saying, if I don't have to, then why should I? Right? <clears throat> um, and that's one thing that I'm, I'm glad that we are calling our young adults now young adults because we are working towards their adulthood and their release into adulthood instead of trying to keep them perpetually as teenagers, to have responsibility and to lead in this world. And the third thing is that fasting requires dedication and fortitude. Okay, So let's talk a few more things that um, the Bible speaks of about fasting. So if you throw this passage up here from the prophets again in the book of Zechariah, it asks the question, should I weep? and abstain in the fifth month as I have done for so many years. So they're restoring Jerusalem, restoring the temple, but yet they're saying, hey, things are going good now. Should we keep fasting? The temple's being rebuilt, and, you know, it's, it, we, why should we mourn for its destruction if we're rebuilding it? Let's have a party. Let's just party. Let's forget this thing, right? Let's forget about fasting. Let's, let's do this. And the response from Hashem and I've, I'm just summarizing this. You can go back and look at the passage. The summary, basically what Hashem says to the, to the people is, um, why are you even asking the question? Because does it really matter? Are you really, are you really, you know, what's the point of you asking? Because when you fasted, was it because your heart was broken for my holy house and its destruction? And when you feasted on a festival... Was it to honor me, or was it to satisfy your bellies? Was it just to have good food and good drink? Or was it because you wanted to rejoice in me? So it boils down to Hashem's answer to that question was, what is your motivation? We all have families. So... Has your spouse, and, and this is obvious, yes, but has your spouse or child ever been hurt physically or had their feelings hurt? Okay. Now, how did you respond? Kick them? No. Punch them? Laugh at them? Besides Dave. We're going to exclude Dave here. <laughs> no. I mean, our, our hearts break, and we want to fix the problem. And there's some things that we have to let our children go through, of course, and, and, and become stronger through those things. But our hearts ache when the people that we love are hurting, and we want to do whatever we can to fix it. My question is, how much more so <clears throat> should we do this for Hashem, for God, when His holy house has been destroyed? And, and we have the opportunity to um, take on empathy of the the God of the universe and his loss. Yeshua, in the Matthew chapter 11, he told the people of his day, he, he had, had some conflict with them. In this passage, he says, <clears throat> But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge, and you didn't mourn. Next one. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. So John, he practiced more asceticism, and he you know, focused on, on how can I be less a part of this world, and he took on extra fasting days and, and certain things and gave up certain things. But Yeshua came, and he was eating and drinking. He was enjoying himself. And they said, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. That's one of my favorite passages, that wisdom is justified by her deeds. Because a lot of times we praise people for what they know 
instead of what they do and the way they live. <clears throat> and so in this passage, Yeshua talks about, you know, in, in the similar passage that Paul talks about, that we, we um, enjoy life together, we rejoice together, but we also weep together. We also go through the difficult times together. And so most of the time, the voice of our flesh completely drowns out the voice of our soul. And as I said earlier in the U.S., we're addicted to pleasure and entertainment, constantly feeding our flesh. Obscene doses of Netflix, video games, mobile devices, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and there's probably a, oh, TikTok, I didn't think about TikTok, and a thousand other things that we can add to the list. Like a junkie, we're constantly looking for our next fix. And so fasting is an opportunity for the soul to refuse to listen to the demands of the flesh and allow us to hear that still, small voice of the Lord within us. So outside of Yom Kippur, all the biblical fasts are to mourn the destruction of God's holy house. Am I correct? Am I wrong on that? The biblical fast? In, in a way, they're all tied to it yeah, somehow. They, okay, <clears throat> and so this passage in Haggai is another um, talks about how the Lord views things and shows His heart in this passage in Haggai chapter one. Do I have Haggai one in there? There we go. Thus says the Lord of hosts: Consider your ways. Okay, go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house. What house is He talking about? My house that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Basically, you've done your own thing, and I have destroyed it, and here's why. Next passage. It's the second part of this. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, uh, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and all their labors. Ne um, why? De declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. You know, it's, it's easy. I... I am one of the most, and here's a, here's a weird contradiction. I'm the most, one of the most empathetic people you'll ever meet, and I am the one of the most non-empathetic people you'll ever meet <laughs> at the same time. The, it's it's weird, I know, but I don't I don't I haven't sat down to figure out exactly how, how I'm wired. But there's some things um, that I will hear people in relationships, people talking, and different things, and my heart will just I. I sit, having a text conversation with my wife just yesterday, and I was just on the point of tears, you know, just of, of I just talked to somebody, and I was just a wreck, you know, because I, I just, I saw something wonderful and beautiful, and I also hurt for them in the process. But there are other times that somebody can be in a lot of pain and hurting and stuff like that, and my heart is just stone for some reason. I, I don't know why the difference I think we're all maybe a little bit that way. There's certain things that trigger us and certain things that don't. And I think we need to all work, and I can only speak for myself, of allowing our hearts to ache, to hurt for other people and for the Lord when He's hurting, when He's aching, when He's desiring that people would love Him, walk in His ways and so forth. And so, <clears throat> in this example, we saw that the house of Hashem was in ruins, but yet the people were enjoying their own homes. And David, he had a heart that basically said, I can't build my palace while we don't have a, a, a glorious house for the Lord. You know, He wanted to do something for the Lord, so he began plans immediately. Solomon was able to fulfill that in his day. So, I'm going to wrap this up with this. Our spiritual identity is not found 
in the pleasures of this world. Our spiritual identity is not found in our work. It's not found in our success, our status, our awards, our achievements, but our identity is found in Messiah. And it is found within Him, and it transforms us. If you want to read some time about your identity, go check out the book of 1 Peter, specifically chapter 2. It talks about us being called out from among the pagans to be a holy people, set apart, grafted into Israel, and, and for a purpose. We are to be part of this holy house. We are to be functioning in a, a way that brings glory and honor to the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in this world. We were formerly pagans, but now we are strangers and aliens. Um, and this, the ESV calls it sojourners and exiles, which works as well. When I was a youth pastor, Sabrina and I were youth pastors, many moons ago, um, we, we called our youth group, based on this passage in 1 Peter 2, um, our youth, youth was called the outsiders. Because I wanted to instill within them that they're not locked into the matrix, if you will. They're outside of that. And they need to see themselves as not part of this world system. So I would encourage you to step into your identity in Messiah if you haven't already. And so returning to my original question, why should we participate in these minor fasts? <clears throat> if nothing else, because you're part of Shalom Macon. And what do I mean by that? Not because you have to do something because you're Shalom Macon. I mean that because the heart of Shalom Macon is love. I've seen that over and over and over again. The heart of Shalom Macon is love. And the heart of love hurts when the hearts of others is breaking. And I've seen that in this, in this congregation as well. I've seen us come together. I've seen us love on one another, help one another, pull each other through hard, hard times. The heart of God is broken and continues to break over the destruction of His holy house, as we have seen through these scriptures. The book of Romans, as I alluded to earlier, Paul says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. But the good news is, it's not permanent. It's temporary. And that weeping in this life reminds us that there will be rejoicing in that world that is yet to come. Amen? So we weep now so that we can fully rejoice later. If we're supposed to weep with people that we love, how much more so with Hashem. So I'll lead you with, the, with this one fact. Fasting is difficult, and most people have a fear of doing difficult things. I can raise my hand on that. Things, Certain things, I, I'm fearful because they're difficult. <clears throat> now, you guys thought you were going to get by a whole sermon without me having a, a science fiction or fantasy reference, didn't you? The book Dune, uh, and the movie as well, uh, one of my favorite lines is, fear is the mind killer. And that is true because it will cripple us. It will paralyze us and make us do, not do the things that we are supposed to do. And so my challenge to you is to take up the love, take up the empathy for your brother and for your God and be driven by love and participate in these fasts and don't fear. Be fearless. Amen. Shabbat shalom.